going to get right into it. Vorticity. So what are, what is vorticity and wind shear? Um, we're going to start with wind shear. Um, and usually when you're talking about severe storms forecasting, this is in reference to how the horizontal wind changes as you go up with height. Vorticity is sort of a a more all in a, a broader concept that refers to that sort of microscopic sense of rotation that air parcels have due to gradients in the velocity field. Um, and wind shear has uh, an associated vorticity vector that's directed 90 degrees to its left. Um, we have this over uh, this diagram over here. You can see the wind shear. Um, you're going to have sort of an overturning motion there. That's that sense of rotation that you get with the wind shear. Um, but again, there are other things that can produce vorticity as well, as, as we'll see later on. So how can vorticity influence the pressure field? It's one of the main things that vorticity does in storm scale dynamics. Um, we know from physics that any object, uh, in this case, we're going to be talking about fluid parcels, um, and circular motion requires a centripetal acceleration. In other words, a, uh, an acceleration directed towards the axis of rotation. Um, when we're talking about storm scale dynamics, the only mechanism really to provide that acceleration are pressure gradients. Um, and since the pressure gradient force always acts from high to low pressure, there's really no other uh, possibility than low pressure at the center um, of rotation. Um, so the result, um, anytime you have vorticity, you're going to have low pressure. Now, an important note uh, is that this is only relevant to perturbations in vorticity from the base state. Um, you can have large vorticity everywhere, but you're still not going to have low pressure. It's really the local maximums in vorticity that influence the pressure field. And uh, one more note. Um, this is completely agnostic to the sense of rotation. So both cyclonic and anticyclonic vorticity will give you low pressure of equal magnitude. Uh, that'll come into play a little later. So for the purpose of this presentation, um, it'll be useful to visualize vorticity as these sort of tubes of fluid with a fixed volume that can be sort of stretched and tilted and moved around by the flow around them. Um, this is kind of a, a neat way to think about it because the rotation rate ends up being proportional to the radius of the tube. This, you can think of this like conservation of angular momentum, the classic example being the ice skater pulling their arms in and spinning faster. It's the same idea. Um, the tube, as I said, can be moved around and warped by uh, the wind field. And the rotation direction is going to be given by the right hand rule. And what I mean by that is if you curl your fingers in the direction of the rotation, your thumb pointing up out of your right hand is the vector associated with that. Um, it's a, a concept from physics. Um, so that's going to be uh, the vorticity vector. And just uh, as convention, I'm gonna have it pointing out of this flat cylinder face. Um, it's not, it's really only necessary for one of the demonstrations, but um, uh, it's just a note there. So we're going to move into the vorticity equation. And I'm not going to show you the actual equation because it's a lot of vector calculus. Um, but this is sort of a visual representation of what all the different terms of that equation do. So on the left hand side where it says vorticity tendency, that's just talking about how the vorticity is changing in time. Um, and the, the three terms on the right are the different things that contribute to that tendency. So the first one being stretching. Um, if you have, you know, you can think of it like if you're stretching out a rubber band, it gets longer in one direction, but narrower in the other. Um, and you can use that, you know, as the tube gets narrower, its rotation rate has to increase, and so you increase the vorticity. Um, the second term being tilting. Uh, this one is fairly straightforward. You can think of it, you know, you have a tube moving along, and then it encounters, let's say, an updraft. It's going to get tilted into the vertical. Um, it's basically, it doesn't actually like create vorticity, it just reorients it um, in 3D space. Um, and the last one being probably one of the more complicated ones to sort of intuitively understand, and that would be baroclinic generation. Um, and I think 
probably the most surface level way to describe it is it's due to gradients in density um, across the fluid um, that can also act to spin up vorticity. And we're gonna see how all three of these processes contribute to severe storms dynamics. Um, this is gonna be heavily focused on supercells and tornadoes, but a lot of this also applies to squall lines and uh, other modes of convection. So the first example we're going to look at is one of tilting, and it's going to be what happens when you have an updraft situated in shear. Um, so just a refresher on our situation here, um, this is going to be an example of crosswise vorticity. Um, we call it crosswise because the vorticity and storm relative velocity vectors are sort of like crossing each other. Um, they're like 90 degrees from each other. Um, that uh, magenta vector is supposed to be pointing into the page. It's I know it's probably not the uh, the best, but just imagine the wind is going into the page and it is uh, perpendicular to these tubes of, of crosswise vorticity. So what we're going to do next is we're going to see what happens when this updraft um, becomes stronger and pushes through all, all the way up to the stratosphere. So you see uh, on either side, they get tilted into the vertical, but they get tilted um, in different ways. So you can see uh, the result here, we have cyclonic vorticity to the right of the shear, um, but we have anti-cyclonic vorticity to the left of the shear, the same magnitude, but they get tilted in opposite directions just because of the way the updraft pushes through the middle of them. Um, and uh, just going back to what we learned before, um, vorticity, these, these local maximums in vorticity will induce low pressure on either flank of the updraft. Um, and because of that, you know, you could think you have a bubble of low pressure aloft, air is gonna accelerate up towards it. Um, and that's going to lead to vertical motion that causes the updrafts to preferentially grow on those two flanks. And this is actually the mechanism that allows storms to split. Um, it's uh, probably a phenomenon that a lot of you are familiar with. Um, within strong shear, storms will actually split into two. Um, and uh, this is really the, the mechanism behind it, that tilting of crosswise vorticity and the resulting upward directed pressure gradient forces um, cause the storms to move apart. The second example of tilting that we're going to look at is mesocyclones. Um, how do mesocyclones develop? Uh, this is sort of going to be the answer to that. Um, so what I have here is, uh, situation. We've got vorticity coming in. This is going to come in from left to right. Um, we'll see what that's called in a minute. Um, but these white uh, arrows represent the updraft of the storm. So you can see the updraft is strongest in the middle, and then it slowly tails off as, as you go to the edge. So we have a gradient in vertical velocity. Um, so now we're going to run this through, and we see that as this vorticity enters the storm, it is forced to be oriented into the vertical because it's encountering stronger and stronger updraft. Um, and eventually, once it gets to the center of the updraft, um, where it's at its strongest, it is uh, oriented vertically um, or close to it. So what we call this is streamwise vorticity. And it's called streamwise because the vorticity sort of follows streamlines in the flow. Um, that's sort of where, where the terminology comes from. Um, and opposite to the crosswise vorticity example we had before, um, streamwise vorticity happens when the vorticity and the storm relative velocity vectors are parallel to each other. So you can think of it like the spiral of an American football. Um, you know, if you throw a perfect spiral, the direction of motion is the same as the axis of rotation. Um, and that's sort of the hallmark of streamwise vorticity. Um, and this is really how mesocyclones acquire their rotation. Um, it's taking this uh, horizontal spin from the environment and incorporating it into a vertical axis um, via this tilting mechanism. Next, we're going to move on to an example of stretching, and we're going to go right into tornado genesis. Um, so our situation here, we have uh, a tube of uh, spin right at the ground, but it's not very strong spin. You can see the tube is very wide. It's very slow rotation. However, um, you can see in the velocity field, um, we have uh, this, this updraft that increases as you go up in height, 
and then the corresponding horizontal winds to conserve mass. Um, and we're gonna see what this velocity field does to this pretty weak vorticity in a short amount of time. So you can see the result of this velocity field is that uh, the vorticity gets stretched and it becomes much more intense than it was before. Um, this is actually an exponential process if you work out the math. Um, and so we went from really weak rotation underneath uh, this storm to really strong rotation concentrated over a small area. Um, and so all else being equal, uh, the larger your increase in vertical velocity is, we call this in uh, mathematical speak, uh, dw dz. It's just the derivative of the updraft with respect to height. Um, and uh, the larger and larger that gets, the more likely tornadoes become. And it's really become the focus of, of modern tornado forecasting. Um, given supercells, how large do we think that dw dz is going to be? And this stretching process is really in, incredible in the context of other vorticity processes, because as I said before, it's, it's very non-linear, it happens very quickly. Um, and you can have vorticity uh, beneath a supercell increase by an entire order of magnitude in just a couple minutes um, due to the stretching process. So it's a really powerful tool and it's probably no coincidence that it produces uh, some of the most extreme things our atmosphere can do, um, tornadoes. And so, Going into a little more detail about DWDZ, um, how do you go about forecasting this? Um, there are sort of a, a two main factors that people have zeroed in on that really influences this uh, vertical velocity gradient. Um, the first one being the strength of your low level mesocyclone. In other words, how much spin you have right at the, the cloud base of, of the storm. Um, it turns out that you know, you have stronger rotation, you're going to have stronger low pressure. And that low pr pressure and the resulting acceleration up towards the low pressure um, can really uh, ramp up DWDZ. Um, and so that's uh, one of the things we look for. Um, near surface streamwise vorticity and storm relative helicity, uh, some common parameters that we use to evaluate potential mesocyclone strength. Um, yeah, and then the second one, the second factor being the cold pool temperature. Um, it turns out that most of the air bound for tornadoes um, originates from the supercell's cold pool. In other words, the rain cooled air. Um, it turns out that that's kind of necessary for getting the vorticity in the tornado in the first place. And we'll uh, talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, but the upshot is that uh, warmer cold pools, in other words, less, de less dense cold pools are easier to accelerate upwards and thus you can get larger vertical velocity gradients. Um, so we look for that as well. There are a couple things you can use as sort of a, a, a first order proxy for um, the cold pool density. Um, some popular ones are LCL height um, and low level relative humidity, like in the average relative humidity over some layer. Um, those, are, those are pretty common. And on the left here, I have a paper or a figure from a paper, sorry. Um, that sort of illustrates the predictive power of these just these two simple parameters. Um, on the uh, x-axis here, we can see um, an increasing mixed layer LCL. Um, that tells you as you go to the right on the graph, you're getting colder and more dense cold pools that are harder to lift. Um, on the y-axis here, we are seeing a low level shear increase. This is shear in the lowest one kilometer. Um, so as you go up on the graph, you're getting stronger mesocyclones. Um, and you can see that there's a clear clustering of tornadic events um, up into the left of the graph and a clear clustering of non-tornadic storms uh, to the right and to the bottom. Um, so it turns out just using these two principles, you can get a pretty good idea of the, the probability that a supercell will produce a tornado. And I have the link to the, uh, uh, the paper at the bottom if anyone's interested. So now we're going to go to sort of the final term that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, and that's the baroclinic term. Um, and the classic example of baroclinicity in a thunderstorm is its gust front. Uh, a gust front is just a boundary. It's kind of like a mini cold front that separates uh, the dense outflow of a storm from its less dense surroundings. 
And those large gradients in density across uh, the gust front um, like to spin up horizontal vorticity. And we can see in this time lapse on the right, um, you can kind of see this vorticity spin up if you can follow my cursor here. Um, this is just a storm, uh, a summer storm at my house. Um, but you can, if you watch um, a lot of gust fronts, you're probably bound to see this effect here, um, this rotation spinning up. Um, so that's cool. Uh, what's the point? What, is, what, what does this uh, mean for storm dynamics? Um, it plays a role in the maintenance of MCSs, um, that circulation strength that turns out how it interacts with the ambient shear can determine whether or not a squall line will mature or decay. Um, and it is also believed to be the primary source of vorticity for tornadoes. Um, whereas mesocyclones get their vorticity from the environment, um, it appears that tornadoes require the storm itself to generate new vorticity. Um, I think, <laughs> I don't want to say that definitively, because depending on who you talk to, uh, you might get a difference of opinions. But it's generally accepted that um, the vorticity in tornadoes comes mostly from baroclinicity. And so now we're going to put it all together. And I'm going to show you how all three of these vorticity processes, tilting, stretching, and baroclinicity, all contribute to tornado genesis. Um, so right here. Um, I, we're going to start with what we just talked about, which is baroclinic generation. Um, this is looking at the forward flank of the supercell. So we have cold air uh, sinking out under and then warm air rising up over. You get this rotation here. This is vorticity produced baroclinically. Um, and next, we're going to see as it moves towards the supercell, um, it gets tilted by downdrafts into the vertical. Um, again, it's produced baroclinically, it gets tilted into the vertical, and it ends up underneath the mesocyclone where it is stretched to tornado strength uh, due to large upward accelerations. Um, it gets amplified and uh, becomes a tornado. And sort of lastly, that upward acceleration is itself induced by this low-level mesocyclone, which is a result, oops, which is a result of the tilting of environmental uh, vorticity. So, you know, this is really showing all three of the vorticity processes together, um, both vorticity generated by the storm and from its environment. So vorticity is a really powerful tool um, for talking about storm dynamics, um, because it's pretty much every storm scale process is associated with vorticity in some way. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a really nice way to look at things. And with that, um, I'm going to be done with the regular presentation. Um, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, it was a lot of fun to put this presentation together and I am uh, welcome to take questions.